Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord. If those who are in the lobby can make their way in, uh, we're going to get started here. How many of you are excited to be here? How many of you are excited to be here? I want to thank the Lord for, uh, for Pastor Costi. Um, can we just lift a, a joyful noise for Pastor Costi? He's speaking in, speaking in Tennessee this, uh, this evening and just thank him and, and Pastor William, Pastor Emily, thank you for their steadfastness. So uh, be praying for him, uh, be praying for the service in Nashville tonight. And uh, how many of you excited that Cedo is here in this house today? You guys call him Cedo, but his name is Bishop William Hinn. And I think it's right that we start bestowing honor to the set man. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen? I think it's important, too, that we pull on him today. Um, 1 Timothy 5, very familiar part of, of Scripture, it says that uh, those who labor in the word are worthy of double honor. So I think it's important that we bestow that honor on him today. Amen? So can we make a commitment? This is going to be a mandate for this house. Can we lean forward in our spirits today? The Lord has put a word in his heart that he is going to deliver today. So it's up to us to pull it out of him as well. Amen? Are you all, are you all awake? You're good? You excited? Amen? Amen. It's important, too, that we lean in on wisdom. We're going to worship first. We're going to praise the Lord first. But it's important that we lean into wisdom because there's security in wisdom. Amen? Proverbs 4 says that wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and in all you're getting, get understanding. Proclaim and exalt it. Amen? Amen. Awesome. So before we get to the word, I just want to share something real quick out of Psalms. How many of you are excited to worship the Lord? Psalms 95 says, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hands. And jump to Psalms 96. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. How many of you are excited that the good news is in our praise? Amen. The good news is in our praise. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It shall not be moved. He shall judge the peoples righteously. Let the heavens rejoice and the earth be glad. How many of you are excited to come into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise? Lift your voice. Begin to make a shout. Begin to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Lord Jesus, thank you, Father. We ask for an outpouring of your presence today, Lord. We come to sing a new song, Lord. In this new season, Lord, the oil that we had previously is not going to carry. The glory that we have experienced, Lord, doesn't even pale in comparison to what we are going to experience. But we come with a new song and a new expectation. Come on, church, begin to lift your voice. Make a shout, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Lord, we come to worship and bow down. We kneel before you, our maker, for you are our God. We are your sheep of your pasture, Lord. We are your people, Father. We come to magnify your name, Lord. Let your name be glorified today. Lord, we, we worship you, Father. We thank you for the musicians, Lord. Anoint them, anoint the singers, anoint the musicians, Lord. We come with no other motive but to give you glory. We don't worship out of circumstance, Father. We worship because you are good. And in that worship, in that heart posture, Lord, we believe that freedom break out in this place in Jesus' name. Believe, church. Believe with me. We pray, Lord, that sickness break off this place, Father. We pray that depression and anxiety has no place in this house, Lord. 
Holy Spirit, come and reign on this place in Jesus' name. We magnify your name. We praise your name, Lord. We lift your name high. We thank you, Father. Thank you for this house, Lord. Thank you for Pastor Costi and Pastor Erica. Thank you for Pastors William and Emily. Lord, continue to strengthen them. Continue to visit them daily, Lord. Continue to put your word in them, Father. We thank you for Bishop William. We thank you for the word that he is going to deliver today, Father. We thank you, Father, for everything. Everything we have is from you, Lord. We just want to steward your presence. We want to set a table, and we want you to come and dine, Lord. We want you to be here with us. So, Lord, have your way today, Father, in Jesus' name. Have your way today, Lord. We magnify your name, Father. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor and all the praise, Lord. People, lift up a shout of praise. Let's worship him in Jesus' name.
give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Grace. Give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken and great.
Worthy is the 
with every hand raised to him. We're here to magnify your great name, God. We're here to worship who you are. For the greatness of your name. From everlasting to everlasting, we shall magnify your great name. Age unto age, we shall lift up the holy name of our King. From generation to generation, shall the echo of your name be exalted. For all nations shall come and bow before your holy throne. Every name that has ever been named shall bow before you. For there is no other name that is given among men than the name of Jesus. We shall cry holy Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is full of His glory.
for your faithfulness, for your endurance, for your patience, for your grace, for your enduring mercies, for your everlasting kindness, for the sacrifice for the blood that's been shed because of Jesus. Where would we be without your grace? What would be our end without your mercy? How great is your name? Your ways are a marvel. Just two more minutes. I want to worship. Whatever. Yeah, Jesus. Let it Pour down your spirit, God. Open the flood. Pour down your spirit. Today in Jesus' name, there shall be no diseases left in this house. In the mighty name of Jesus, there shall be no cancers, not even the common cold. We declare in Jesus' name, no diseases, no viruses, no COVIDs shall touch this congregation. I need someone to agree. The powers of hell shall be able to touch this your people God in Jesus name pour down your spirit remove every infirmity remove every sickness remove every disease remove every bondage come on church let the power of your name let it rain open up the heaven the freedom stand in faith I declare in Jesus name whatever has been opposing you will flee you I declare in the name that is above all other names I need you to agree I don't want you to listen and watch I need you to engage Every harassing demon shall never harass you again. Every thought that is not of Christ shall be brought to captivity.
beneath your feet. The powers of hell will have no influence over you in the name that is above all other names. Heartaches shall flee. Pains shall go away. Discouragement, depression, oppression shall be no more. I break the spirit of suicide. It shall never haunt your mind again. In Jesus' name. I hear the Lord say, I am the God of restoration. I am the God of restoration. I will restore the years that the locust has eaten. I will do more in one night than all life long. That mother's broken heart the loss of her son I declare in the name of Jesus supernatural healing supernatural restoration come on does anyone here believe People of God, listen to me carefully. God says, I declare a new thing. A new thing. I don't want you to listen. I want you to raise your hands. He's talking to all of you. Lift your hands. No matter your background, family upbringing, heartaches, family breakups, Whatsoever it is you've lived through, I'm here to tell you if you will believe with me today that as of today, in Jesus' name, it is over. I said it is, it is over. It is over. I'm, listen, I'm talking to all of you. Whatever has been, it's over. You will make a turnabout face. Never look at it again. You are not a victim. You are a child of the Most High God. You don't live in your past. You live in the present. The King of Glory is your Father. Glorify your name, Jesus. Glorify your glorious name.
your kingdom come, Lord. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done, Lord. done in this earth as it is in heaven let this earth replicate emulate resemble reflect what is going on in heaven and this your people will not be affected of what is going on in the earth but what is going on in the heavens and it will release it into the earth I want you to hear me church in Jesus name the conditions of this world will not affect you I said the conditions of this world will not affect you the conditions of this world will not affect your family they will not affect your children they will not affect your children's children only the activity of heaven will invade your life does anyone here believe so father we give you all that has been the good the bad and the ugly we lay it all at your feet we declare you are the owner you are the Lord you are the possessor everything about our life belongs to you so we bring to you our weaknesses our successes our dreams our fears, our doubts, our insecurities. And we say, God, we give it all. Now take us over. Take us completely over. Come on, church. Take us completely over. Don't ever allow the spirit of fear. It is a spirit. Not even the spirit of doubt to get into your mind. No place for the enemy. We're not only believers. We are the children of the most high God. We don't just believe in him. We are his offspring. We are the family of God. The kingdom is not coming. The kingdom is in you. And the kingdom is here. And if you believe you are a citizen of the kingdom, give God a great shout. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you believe the Lord our God is worthy of a mighty praise? Has he been good to you? I said, has he been good to you? Hallelujah. Let us prepare to continue our worship with our tithes, our offerings. You may be seated. Get your hearts prepared to honor the Lord with our tithes and offerings. Can we thank God for the worship team? Can we thank God for... <clears throat> For all the servants of this house, 
I honor you today. How many of you love his presence? The tithe is the Lord's. I said the tithe is the Lord's. And if there's an argument within your mind, Old Testament, New Testament, stop tithing. But if you understand the principle of honor that was from before the law, when Abraham honored Melchizedek, he wasn't following a law. He was following an honor. When God dealt with Cain, he said, had you done it right, I would have received it. He received Abel's, but not Cain's. God does not receive every offering. God receives that which is of a willing heart. The first murder in Scripture was because of money. The first sin after Exodus that destroyed a whole family was because of money. What separated the children of Israel in the wilderness was because of money. The first death as judgment in the book of Acts, this is not Old Testament, was because of money. God is after the willing heart. God needs nothing. You have to understand. I want us to equate, and I'm not going to do a, a sermon on offering. I know you people give. And I also know that resignation is in time of need. I don't know that I'm supposed to say that. My sons may get mad at me, but that's the good news. If they're just sons. I'm the dad. But I'm going to do what I feel the Lord wants me to do. When things get tight, you press in harder. When you have less, give more. There's no amount that God gives you some requirement, no such thing. But I can tell you ever having served him all these decades, there's a clear line of distinction between givers and takers. I can take you throughout history and show you the difference between the favor of God. You know, my brother Benny, when he was here, he said, you know, God doesn't love everyone. I disagree with that. But God does not favor everyone. See, we don't need the love. But we already have the love. You, you understand? And when I say we don't need it, of course, uh, how many of you know the Lord loves you? And, and it, it has nothing to do with you. It's not emotional. There's nothing about God that's an emotional love. God is love. Therefore, it is the extension of who He is. You understand? And so if you, um, if you ask me to be something I'm not, I can't. But when you ask me to be something that's natural, then it's an automatic reaction. So God can't help Himself. Even when you deny Him, the Word of God says He can't deny Himself. So I've learned that I don't respond to people by how they treat me. If that would have been the case, I'd be in jail now. I have to do what is right before God in me. My responsibility is not them. My responsibility is how I behave before God. And so oftentimes, we don't understand that there's a certain nature in this love. There's nothing in it, listen carefully, that equates to being lukewarm. 
Everything about God is red hot. Nothing lukewarm. How we approach Him can't be lukewarm. How we give can't be lukewarm. How we worship can't be lukewarm. How we lean forward can't be lukewarm. God is such that He would rather have you cold. Can I just take one step further? If I was to deal with, if I had a choice between dealing with a demonized individual or a lukewarm individual, I would take the demonized any day. Why? Because I can cast the devil out of them and fill them with the fire of the Spirit. It's just that simple. And I've done it over and over by the power of God. And it's by the grace. But lukewarm, it's a condition. It lacks fervor. What we need is the baptism of fire. A lot of people have been baptized in the Holy Ghost, but they need to be baptized in fire. Even the baptism of water, not just the natural, but the spiritual. You know what it's supposed to do? Talk to me. What is it supposed to do? Like, is it just some sort of ceremonial thing? When you get baptized, you know, the word is the washing. The washing of old mindsets. The word washes your brain, washes your past, cleanses your heart. The word of God is like water that cleanses. The baptism of water is not just being dunked in. I mean, I got dunked into the Jordan. I mean, like right where Jesus was baptized. Ask me if it did anything. I mean, we got pictures. We had some wonderful experiences and it was wonderful. And the water was cold. The last time I was there, my brother Benny and I with the family, my, brother, my son William was there, all the family were there. And we baptized Todd White in the Jordan. Now, you would know it was Todd because he looked normal. I mean, he still looks normal, just fiery. You know, it's a testimony. It's a glorious experience. If you've never had it, you should do it. But it's the constant continuation of the being washed by the Word that cleanses your mind. Gets rid of thoughts that don't belong in your head. And then comes the fire. Where the fire is locked up in your bones. You can't help yourself. My grandchildren ask me, why do you yell when you preach? I don't know! It's a spontaneous reaction. People think I'm too deep, I'm too whatever, too intense. Well, maybe you're just shallow. And lukewarm, not you, just generally speaking. Because there's nothing in God that is lukewarm. Don't ever, ever, you might as well keep it. Don't ever give God leftover. Always give God the best. Do the what? Say that one more time. The best. And you don't base it on calculation. You base it on obedience. It's what honor is. And there's a lot of connivers, cheaters, thieves, robber, rapists in the body of Christ take money from people that have nothing to do with God. God is nowhere near it. Do this for $1,000 and you'll get that. Don't get involved in that nonsense. Just honor God and what you have. Let your heart be willing before Him. So if you're ready, come on, stand to your feet. The ushers will be ready. We're going to lift it before the Lord first. Come on, lift it before God. If you have it in your hand, you have it on your phone, however you people do it here, the information is going to be up on the screen risennation.org if you're giving online but we're going to honor God and it's the conclusion part of our worship so Father it is our honor our great privilege that we bring this our tithes and offerings that your name may be glorified the highest value that could be to a dollar is to take it out of the denomination of money and turn it into an offering that woman with the last might 
gave more than all the Pharisees. Because the value of worship, if we could worship you with our finances, it doesn't matter how much, but it's for worship. It's set aside, devoted, designated, sanctified, consecrated for worship. That it may be a sweet smelling savor that is well pleasing. Magnify your name in this, your people. The wealth of the wicked is being stored for the just, not the takers, not the greedy, not the fearful, but those that are just, those that do it right. So regardless of this world's economy, this, your people, shall prosper in all that they do. In Jesus' name. Come on, and all the people of God said, Amen. Come on, let us pass the offering buckets. Amen. Lord bless you. you. May be seated. Can you all hear me all right? Yes. Can someone say hallelujah or something? Hallelujah. Now, you know I don't like it quiet, right? Um, I'm, I'm so delighted and honored today to be here with you. Both of my sons actually are in, in Franklin, Tennessee. Uh, Pastor William and Costi, and uh, I believe it's actually William this morning or this evening that's bringing the words. You want to log on to that, and he's got a word uh, for that people over there, and I believe it's going to speak to all of you here as well. And Costi is there with him, and then next week, uh, Sunday, Costi heads to to Chicago where he ministers a risen nation in Chicago. So you get me twice. So. Um, so how many of you how many of you are planning to come? Five people. I'm not coming. Anybody planning to be here? Anybody hungry for the word of God? And I, I, I know I saw Eric a, a minute ago. Um, but today, today, uh, I'm hoping she could hear me. She's out there changing diapers or whatever it is she does. Um, today is their seventh wedding anniversary and so um, I married them seven years ago today and it's you know I heard my son teach on number seven completion so we're going to believe God that they are completed having two children and a boy is on the way now say amen or something we need more children you know we need a whole lot more I would like to have a whole stack of them. Yeah. You know, just let them multiply. God said multiply. He didn't say have two. <laughs> Why people? Two people. That's it. Two. That's it. You don't really qualify as a parent until you have a bunch of them. And you know, your hair is falling out. Then you, okay, you qualify now. I want to encourage you to listen very intently today. Um, but I... I don't, I, you know, when my wife is worshiping, I want to be front and center. And uh, when I'm ministering, I want her to be front and center so I can see her. So, um, oh, there you are. So little tiny thing, come. Can we thank God for this worshiper? This worshiper, what a... She's, she's been leading our worship as a church for 35 years. She led me into worship for over 40 years. And I'm just amazed at how the presence of God. We've been in services where sometimes they're worshiping in another language. And I don't understand what they're saying. And she'll be standing next to me. Uh, when we had Monse, we were in Panama. I'll never forget it as long as I live. And my wife was like, final tri tri trimester and she was very very pregnant and I don't know what I was thinking but I put her on a single engine airplane and we flew to Panama and we were in a, a warehouse building that um, you know just kind of a metal frame that literally was packed thousands of people in this building you could hear the rain and I remember her standing there with swollen feet in her shoes 
and her belly sticking out. And she was worshiping God like there was no tomorrow. And my daughter was in her belly just swinging from one side to the other. My daughter was having a good time. Her mom was in pain. And I'm like, please, Jesus, not now, not now, not now. And um, it's, it's been that way. She has never, I mean, when she does it, she just puts her whole heart into it. Ask me why. Because we love Jesus. What he's done in our life, only God can do. And I'm so, so grateful for not only her worship, but what an amazing woman of God. What a wife. My wife encourages me. She tells me I'm tall. I'm slim. She lies to me all the time. And I love it. Um, but I, I just can't thank the Lord enough for all of my family, for my children, for the pastors of this house, for all of the leadership that is here. Can we thank God for all of them just one more time? Thank you, Noah. All right, open your Bibles to the book of Exodus. This morning, chapter 11. This morning, I need you to listen very carefully because I'm going to speak to you, not a teaching, but I'm going to give you a word. I actually had not intended to minister on this. I just ministered it to our people recently. And um, I was studying for what I was going to teach. And late afternoon yesterday, I just wasn't sensing the direction. And I could have brought it, and we'll see what the Lord will do next week. But I just could not feel uh, the unction. And this is a word that, that I thought was for our people. And of course, you're part of our people. And, um, you know, I had someone come to me in, in Tennessee. I was just there. Um, I think it was last week. Last Sunday, ministered in Tennessee. And I had this wee woman come up to me and she said, so your name is Cedo? And I said, no. <laughs> you know, my son started this. And uh, Cedo means grandpa. How many of you know? So I'm the old man, uh, but that means we're family. And the Lord just kept kind of provoking me, Exodus, Exodus. So this is not a teaching, though you learn things, hopefully. But it is a prophetic word that must be heard and received according to your faith. This word is going to speak to you according to your what? Faith. Remember... For faith to be faith, it has to be tried. Yes. Kingdom faith is tried faith. Yeah. Well, there's Erica. Did you hear us wish you a happy anniversary? Seven years? Did you hear the part about the boy? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Somebody say amen. amen. For your faith to be faith, it must be tried. When I was saying to you earlier, there's nothing about God that's lukewarm, is that God has a personality where he likes things to get intense, hot. So he will always wait to the last minute to do what he promises. To see if you're going to go cold on him. To see if you're going to go lukewarm. Or do you believe? Because faith is not magic. It's a trial. And so faith to be faith must be tried. Every kingdom citizen must be trained as a kingdom citizen in kingdom faith to be in a good standing as a kingdom citizen. So having this idea that you just believe without a fight, that's not faith. 1 Timothy 6, 12, Paul said to Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life. Lay hold of who you are, where you belong, in your heavenly place. It's describing abide, stand in your spiritual position. So faith is a fight. It's what? Fight. It's not a fight against devils. It is a fight of faith. Fighting demons really... You know, Jesus said, by the pointing of the finger, you see me casting out devils. It's a sign that the kingdom has come. Yeah. 
So that means that when there's demonic powers, we should carry the authority. Hey! And that's it. They're gone. Point of the finger. But as far as faith, God takes you to the end. God takes you to the point where faith is proven to be faith because faith to be faith must be fought. It must be, um, it has to be produced. How can you produce faith without a fight? And it's a fight for what you believe. I've waited for certain promises. I got to tell you something. I heard God years ago, years ago. I'm going to do this. So I was expecting it. Okay, any day now. Guess what? I'm still waiting. It's been 30 years. I can conclude, well, you know what? Maybe it'll never happen. You remember, you remember unto us a child is born? Anybody remember the prophet Isaiah? That means he was expecting it. It was so real that he was expecting it at his time. Remember Paul said, we shall not all sleep. Say we. It's a we thing. So Paul here is feeling the word so real that he said, we shall not all sleep, meaning we're not going to die. But his journey came to an end and he died. Lost his head. The word of God is always present. Say that. It's all, the word of God is always present. present. Therefore, when God gives you a promise, it's going to be a present word. But that present word can last decades. Now, I'm not looking to discourage you thinking you're going to have to wait forever. But what I'm here to tell you is, faith manifests out of what it endures. It's not for the weak of heart. Your faith is as strong as the tests it survives. It is the prerequisite to heaven's trust. God will not use who he cannot trust. And if God's going to use you, he's going to try you. And that includes his own son, Luke 4 tells us. So this word is for the kingdom citizen who understands, without faith, it is impossible to please God. For who comes to God must believe, come on, that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently, say diligently, diligently seek him, Hebrews eleven six, And so this word is a prophetic word about we're exiting. Exodus is not only a type, but also a shadow. Please follow carefully. A shadow is not it. A shadow is what is coming. It is what is about to happen. So, can you see a shadow? Look at the shadow over here. If I have a light behind me, I'm going to cast a shadow. The shadow is but a type. It's a sign of what is about to occur. The Word of God is written, listen, where it's at the activity of a cycle, there comes a point within every cycle called chronos and kairos. I can't get into that too deeply now, but you all should know that there's chronos time, the duration of time, yes? And there's kairos time. Kairos time is now time, right? And so you carry a baby nine months, that is chronos, and then it comes the moment when there is time to push, with me? That Kairos moment, Zechariah 10 says, ask for rain in the time of the latter rain. Say the time. time. Hebrew word ek, which means when you see the clouds full of rain, why would you ask for rain when it's obviously going to storm? But how many times have you seen clouds that are empty? And so God wants you to be able to be in time. You know the times and the seasons, there's a purpose. For every time and season. And so God operates within the circle of activity. The problem is, we don't want to miss the Kairos moment because we don't know when the next one will come. You understand? And so we don't want to wander. So God gives us words that, you know, kind of are generational. And Exodus is not only a type, it's a shadow. 
You understand? It is a prophetic picture, follow carefully, of what is coming, what is at hand. The spirit of Scripture. I need you to understand this principle. The spirit of Scripture. Say that. Is able to use ancient events and present them as a present reality. Old declarations and speak them as current prophecies. And use types and shadows to paint a picture. Hebrews 10.1 says, For the law having a shadow of good things to come, good things. What is it? Good things and not the very image of the things. New Living Translation says, The old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come. Which means it's a good thing. So no matter what the shadow of the law looks like, it's pointing something good is going about to happen. Yeah. You, you understand? Yeah. And so the Word of God is layered in letter and spirit. Yeah. The letter, anyone can read and argue the doctrine. The spirit is, if I took this page and went in between the page, kind of if I can get between this side and that side and what is tucked beneath, it's called spirit. The Word of God is spirit. Jesus rebuking the scribes and Pharisees, and he said to them, there's no life in, in the scriptures. There's only life in me. My word is spirit. Say that. My word is And it is life, which means that God kind of can only reveal to the hungry hearts. It must be by revelation. And so oftentimes people get confused between the old and the new, and we see what's happening in Israel today. You see, in the Old Testament, just so it's clear to you, God was referred to as the God of Israel throughout all the Old Testament. In the New Testament, so that is the natural, natural land, the people of Israel. Talking natural, I'm an Israeli citizen, born in Israel, so from a natural side, I could say I'm an Israeli. But now that does not necessarily give me some free ticket. Because in the New Testament, there's neither Jew nor Greek. Yeah. Just follow this carefully. But it does not disannul the old. Yeah. Why? Because in the Old Testament, God is referred to as the God of Israel. In the New Testament, we are referred to as the Israel of God. Come on, Come on. Come on I want you hear the difference. Yeah. Galatians 6 describes us as the people, the Israel of God. Yeah. Come on, help me with this. Jesus comes and he introduces not Jewish faith so much, but as sonship. Abraham was a Chaldean. What does that make him naturally? Iraqi. But what made him the father of a nation was the father of faith. Somebody say faith. faith. In my country, Israel, you're not defined by your ethnic background. You're defined by your faith. Right. You're not defined by your language. You're defined by your faith. You can speak Arabic. You can speak Hebrew. You can speak Greek. You can speak Armenian. They all live in the same area, in the same neighborhood. But what describes them, what distinguishes them is are you a, a believer of, of Jehovah, Old Testament, only Jew, could not receive Jesus the Messiah? Are you a Muslim, do you believe it's Muhammad? Are you a Christian? Are you a follower of Christ? And so we have to make it clear, we are the Israel of God. A spiritual people of the Spirit. Of what? Spirit. Born of the Spirit. They were brought by covenant. God made a covenant with Abraham, then with Isaac, and then with Jacob. We are their offspring. So if you study Galatians, for example, it'll tell you in Galatians 3.29, if you are Christ's, 
then you are Abraham's seed and heir to the promise. But then God promises. Israel's not over. I said, Israel's not over. I'm talking natural. God promises he's going to win the whole nation. Do you understand what that means? If you read the Romans 11, Paul says, God's going to get them all. That means God's going to, God blinded them for a season. Then he's going to remove the blindfold. That means there's going to be such a revival in the land of Israel. They're going to make a new law. We believe Jesus is the Messiah. And it's going to become open. And I mean, the revival will break out. And multitudes will come to Christ because God removes the blindfold. So it's not over. It is the bone, the structure of the spiritual. Now, after 430 years, God hears the cry, which you will hear about in a moment. But here in this shadow of a type, God is speaking to us by His Spirit, because the Spirit of Scripture is able to use ancient events and present them as present realities, old declarations, and speak them as current prophecies, and use types and shadows to paint a picture. Because again, the law is a shadow of good things to come. And I remember when I received this word, it so exploded in my spirit, because God said to me, you're leaving. And I'm thinking, where am I going? Again? But God was not speaking necessarily relocation. We're not talking about flying anywhere either. Are you ready? Yeah. Exodus chapter 11. As you read, listen carefully. I don't care how many times you've read it. You have your Bibles? Yeah. Verse 1. And the Lord said to Moses, Yet will I bring one plague more upon Pharaoh. Now, how many of you know our God does not change? I'm going to make a statement. I need you to really get a hold of this. Our God is the same yesterday, today, forever. It's all present to Him. Got to follow this now. So what He did then, He is still doing. But it waits on the purpose of time. Because the way God operates, and I know this is going to sound... How many of you have ever... Uh, done something bad. No, let's try backwards. How many of you, and I'm sure nobody here has ever done anything bad, but, but how many of you have done, have done something where God uses you or you experience the grace of God, the goodness of God, God blesses you in some way after you've been a schnook? Help me. And then you can't help but think, Lord, I should have been punished for that, and yet you blessed me. Why? Because though God is all present, all seeing, all knowing, all at once, He operates within the purpose of time, and that is what His presence manifests into. That's all another teaching for another time. When did God choose you? Come on. Out loud. Before the foundation of the world. So that means God saw fit to have a discourse chosen, discourse with you, and choose you before the foundation, set you in the time, in the era, in the century, in the family, in the location, in where God has set you in now, where you are, and with a purpose. The fastest way to heaven is death. And God doesn't want you in heaven. <laughs> okay, if I can't say this here, I'm stuck. Because i got nowhere else to go. I can say it to my group, but that's it. So let me say that one more time. God does not want you in heaven. For what? You are chosen there. You are chosen there for a purpose. So when you're done, he takes you home. And when you get there, he asks you, did you, did you finish? No, I, I retired. Retired from what? A job or purpose? As long as you're breathing, there's something left for you to do. 
And so, you know, sometimes I get tired and I think, you know, it'd be nice to get a little small town in Italy and go retire. <laughs> First of all, we want money. But there's no retirement for the people of God. I mean, you can quit the job. But as far as purpose, what are you here for? What are you doing here? To survive? You are chosen to come here. <laughs> I mean, I get on an airplane and I go to places and I minister. When it's over, I don't just, okay, now what? I go home. I don't want to be done until God is done. And when I walk into the realm of spirit, it's because I'm done here. So you are not allowed to be physical in heaven. And you're not allowed to be spirit in the earth. If you are spirit, you are illegal. You have to be natural. You have to be physical. Demons can't come here without a body. Even if it's a pig. So if you're alive, it's because you are chosen to be in this region to establish the kingdom of God. So when we, when, we are, when we are taught to pray, they came to Jesus, you know, I don't want to preach this. They came to Jesus and they said, you know, we heard you pray. Teach us to pray like that. Now, these were Jews that prayed according to the Old Testament every day. And he says, when you pray, pray like this. You all should know it. Our Father, which art in heaven. Our Father's, so our origin, which art in heaven. Yeah. Yeah. Hallowed be thy name. Then thy kingdom, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. He never said, let your earth come. It's let your kingdom come. He didn't say, let the earth come to heaven. He said, let your kingdom come to the earth. So what God is after is that we be the people that live, exemplify, emulate, reveal, release our origin in this territory. That's why you were born. Otherwise, you have no purpose. And if you think your whole purpose is to work, eat, and die, you're an idiot. I mean, in Jesus' name. <laughs> because there's got to be more to life. You should be something. Help me a little. So your destination is earth. We shall rule and reign on the earth. So if you just take the concept, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done in earth. What God is after is the influence, the lifestyle, the world, the government, everything about heaven be revealed in the earth. So when I'm driving down the highway, I'm not driving down the highway of earth. I live in heaven driving on the 121. And I know that sounds crazy, and I don't want you to get weird and spooky because people have a tendency to do that. I can't stand those kind of crazy, weird Christians. I love you, but knock it off. <laughs> Heaven is a reality. It's a what? Reality. So we got to get this thought of heaven being somewhere. It's a life. It's the life of the Spirit. You're seated in heavenly places. And so what God brought us and restored in us in Christ was the ruling and the dominion over the earth. We've learned it. Now God wants to show you a picture. This is a picture of the people of God being bound to a system. Calls it Pharaoh, the Egyptian order. So here we see this type, this shadow, where God comes and says to Moses, Yet will I bring one more plague upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Follow carefully. 
Afterwards, he will let you go hence. When he shall let you go, he shall surely thrust you out. Hence, all together, we're going to be thrusted out together. Speak now in the ears of the people and let every man, that word borrow means to ask of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor, jewels, silver, jewels of gold. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. So when they went and said, give me, some, give me your gold, they were happy to hand it over. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt and in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of the people. And Moses said, Thus saith the Lord, About midnight will I go out in the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sits upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the handmaidens behind the mill, those are working, and all the, even the firstborn of the beasts. So I want you to understand what took place here. And there shall be a great cry throughout the land of Egypt, such as there never been like it, nor shall be any like it any more. But against any of the children of Israel, there shall not a dog move his tongue, that means bark, against man or beast. Why? That you may know how the Lord does put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. You all see that? Now follow carefully. In verse 1, God is saying, I will do more in one night, in one move. He's talking spiritually. He's talking prophetically. Verse 1, God is saying, I will do one more move before your exodus. I'll do what? One more move before your exodus. After which Egypt, the system of the world will let you go. Not only will it let you go, but it'll thrust you out. It'll drive you out. It'll drive you out of their order. Exodus means you're leaving where you've been. It is the end of that journey, and you're being thrusted into where you're going. Amen. The word Exodus means the act of an instant of going out in a large number. One more time. The word Exodus means the act of an instant of going out in a large number. This is going to affect us all. Somebody say yes. yes. I'm here to tell you we're leaving. Yes. Okay, I don't mean location. I'm not talking rapture. I mean you're leaving where you've been. Yes. And God's going to step you into something altogether new. You ought to say something. Yes. We cannot stay in our old life. We cannot stay in our old conditions. The enemy cannot keep you or restrict you. You're coming out of your old conditions and restrictions. Not only are you leaving, but you're not leaving empty-handed. You're leaving with the wealth of Egypt. And you'll have great favor among them. Verse 5, And all the firstborn of the land of Egypt shall die from their throne to their servants, to their beasts, their labor, their workforce, their economy, saying, Nothing of their line will remain. The order of their generations will be brought to an end. Listen carefully. On one hand, the shedding of blood will bring an end to a bloodline. Providing, on the other hand, the unblemished blood will provide provision and protection. What you once were a slave to, now you will own. And this will not be a recovery. It'll be, you will have what you've never had in abundance. So I need you to see this. Are you all getting a prophetic picture? In one night, God says to Moses, now you got to understand, you'll see more in a second, but 430 years they've waited for this one night. And God says to Moses, I'm going to do one more move. Before your exodus. See I believe we're about to experience. The greatest move of God this world has ever witnessed. I need to say that again. I said I believe. Now, now I need you. I need you to see. Because this is where you take it personal. This is where it impacts your family. 
I believe that you are about to experience, if, if this is where your faith is, where God is saying, before I take you out of where you've been, I'm going to have one more move, and it's going to happen in one night. That response really sucks. I'm going to say that again. See, I, see I'm not giving you, I wanna, I'm talking to you. I don't know where you've been. I don't know what you've been dealing with, but I'm going to say it one more time. Before you exit that where you've been, God's going to do something in one night that's going to change everything. So God says to the children of Israel, I might teach on this next week, we'll see. I want you to every family go into their house, get an unblemished lamb, sacrifice it, put the blood on the doorpost, and I'm going to move in one night. And those that are in the house that has got the blood on the door, I will pass by it. He didn't say all the children of Israel will be protected hanging out in the street. He didn't say put the blood on their head. He didn't say apply the blood on your car, the holy blood of God on stuff. It is the holy blood of the Lamb of God. It's the Lamb being unblemished, speaks of the sinless life of Jesus. And that is on the house. On the what? God deals with families, naturally and spiritually. So your protection is not on your forehead. Your protection is not wandering from house to house. Like a vagabond. Your protection is in the house. The door God put you in. The family you're called to. So God says, when I do this move, you make sure all the children of Israel are in the house. I'm going to protect them in the house. If they're out of the house, they're not with protection. And I'm going to move in one night. So imagine... Every single household in all of Egypt had a child die. From Pharaoh to all the workers, even every firstborn beast. So one night, every firstborn dies. While they're dying, the people of Israel are feasting in the house. Where? Where? In the house. Got to be in the house. And don't tell me God hasn't led you. When God places you in a house, He doesn't necessarily place you where you're comfortable. He places you where you're going to grow and be built and be changed. And He'll put some crazy young man up here that will yell a lot or an old one. And now, on one hand, the shedding of blood ends an old order. And the unblemished blood on the house initiates a new one. I believe this. This is just for me and my house. When God says on the, on the blood that is on the door, this new unblemished blood will provide, follow carefully, provision, protection, it will provide everything that God's going to do in abundance. So I believe in Jesus' name that this whole order of this world, the American system, the whole order of its government, I don't want to get into this too much, but the idiots we got running government, we're about to get delivered from it all. I, now listen. It's only speaking to those in the house. Now, I don't want to be irresponsible. I'm an American citizen now, and I plan to vote big. I'm going to put a big sign on top of a ballot. Get the idiot out! Sorry. If that offends you, get over it. I don't believe how believers in Jesus can vote for that. I can't understand that. It doesn't, I can't wrap my brain around it. The spirit of Nimrod. (laughs) 
And God says in verse 6 and 7, There will be a cry throughout the land like never before. But against you, not even a dog will bark. God will make a difference between you and the world to be so great that it will be obvious to all of them. People will wonder, why are you not dealing with their problems and conditions? Why are you, why are you gaining when they are losing? Why are you blessed in the midst of their struggles? I believe there's going to be a cry for the Lord like we've never seen. Because the people are going to see what God is doing for you and in you. What is it about you? You're not dealing with this. Because I'm in the house. And God says, against you, verse 7, not even a dog will bark. Somebody ask me why. God said, that you may know, listen, that the Lord is putting a difference, a difference between you and the world. The whole reason God is doing this is that you may know there's a difference between you and them. You will not deal with what they have to deal with. What affects them will not affect you. Their needs will not be your needs. Their economical problems will not be your economical problems. I don't think you believe me. You will be in this world and not of it. You got to know this. You see, this indicates when God says, so you'll know. It indicates, it insinuates that you don't really know. You may believe it. You might have heard it. You may repeat it Sunday morning. But do you really, really know it? Absolutely know it. For it to be your reality, you've got to know it. That means when the news is full of bad reports, you know beyond a shadow of a doubt it's not your report. When the world is in the midst of darkness, yours is full of light. When there is chaos in your house, there is perfect peace and perfect harmony. When they're dealing with flies and plagues, you've got sunshine. You've got to know it. Christians are fearful of the conditions of the world that wouldn't even have children. They're afraid to bring their children into this world. What's it going to take for us to stop repeating, we are in this world, not of it? Yeah. Say not of it. Come on. Yeah. Say that again. Yeah. I'm not of Obama. I'm not of, what's his name again? Yeah. Joe yeah. Harris. Yeah. It's not my government. It's not my world. Yeah. Washington thieves and liars and cheaters, yeah. violators, deceptors. Greedy, manipulative, corrupt. I travel all over the world. And I'm here to tell you, we live in one of the most corrupt nations on earth. Because we're slick. They're just, and don't get upset with me, okay? Okay, if you want to get upset, I might as well just go for it. Okay. <laughs> You know, they're, they're, they, they play all sides. I was, remember, I was born in Israel, Arabic speaking. Not a Jew or Christian. They will help my enemies, and then they will help me fight them. So you got, you got this so-called president who will fund Iran, who funds Hamas, who shoots it against Israel and kills babies and children with, with weaponry that is made in the United States of America. And they're making money on both sides. Or we'll buy, the, we'll buy the oil from Russia and send the money to Ukraine. It's all manipulation. We need a righteous government. We need a righteous king. His name is Jesus. And God says, I'm going to eliminate that whole line. I'm going to eliminate the whole system. I'm going to kill the firstborn from the top to the bottom and even their beasts. 
I'm going to cleanse you of all their order, all their mindset, all their influence, and I'm going to do a new work in you. And it's going to happen in one night. And if you think that's too big for God, you don't know who God is. I want to free you from it. You're coming out of it. One more move before your exodus. So every day I wait. I, I'm actually at the point where I don't want to hear the details of all what's going on in the news because I get frustrated. And you know, I, I have a tendency to, to want to cuss. So, I'm oh, sorry. Turn it off, put on Raymond or something. <laughs> Everybody loves Raymond, and I love Raymond, so <laughs> you know. Frank is my favorite personally, but anyway. <laughs> I just want to hear enough. Is it happening? Is the night here? It's God about to move. Now, I did not plan to bring this word recently. And the way I received it, I was awakened early in the morning. It's Exodus time. Exodus. Now, I don't know about anybody else, but that spoke to me. It's time to get out. Something's about to happen. And you're leaving your own life. And God says, go to the people and take their gold. I'm going to put a difference. I'm going to make sure you know it, that there's such a difference. In verse 7, the word difference, listen, it means to distinguish, to show marvelous, to set apart, to sever, to make wonderful. The Hebrew word says, I'm going to show you there's a difference. I'm going to show you something marvelous. I'm going to show you something wonderful. Listen, go to, go to chapter 8. Just go back. Exodus chapter 8. The same word is used. Let's look at verse 20. And the Lord said to Moses, rise up early in the morning, stand before Pharaoh, Lo, he comes forth to the water and say unto him, Thus said the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. That word is worship me. Else, listen, if thou will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies upon thee and upon thy servants and upon thy people and into thy houses and the houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies. Can you imagine my daughter Michelle and Erica would go out of their mind. Not just one fly, a whole full house of them. And also the ground they're on, they are. Listen, verse 22. I will sever. I will what? Sever. In that day, the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there. To the end, here's why, that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. I will put a division between my people and thy people. Tomorrow you shall see this sign. Oh, Jesus. So you will know. And God here is saying, follow carefully. I'm going to show you a distinction to such a degree. The word here to sever means to distinguish, show marvelous again, to make wonderful. Verse 23, I will put a division. It means a deliverance, a redemption, and separation in the land of Goshen. Goshen is still in Israel, not far from where Pharaoh actually was. Genesis 45, 10, when Joseph, the ruler of Egypt, invited his brothers to move to Goshen, it was so they would be near him. So this is near Pharaoh. But yet, they're not touched by what's going on in Pharaoh's house. In verse 7, he said, God sent me before you. This is what Joseph said to his brothers in Genesis 45. God sent me before you to preserve your posterity in the earth to save your lives by a great deliverance. That's Goshen. 
To save your life by a great deliverance is Goshen. It is the place of deliverance, a place of redemption, a place of protection and provision. It is a marvelous and wonderful place in God. You see, don't let this bother you, but the more bad news I hear, I kind of get a little excited. I don't mean the people dying. I don't mean that. I don't mean the horrible things they're doing in the streets of, of, of Palestine or, or Israel. I mean... The more exposure that's going on in our government, the more that, that stupid, dumb look on a CNN reporter, <laughs> the more they can't say any, any, you know, there's no rebuttal, the more I get excited. God's about to move. God's about to move. God is bringing an exposure. He's going to deal with all of it. Because I know that once God deals with it, listen carefully, he puts his people in a place of, of Goshen. Follow carefully. After God puts them in Goshen, and now they're delivered out of the land of bondage, listen to the sequence of events after the Exodus. At the, after the Red Sea. Chapter 15 says they were, they were preserved from thirst. In chapter 16, they were preserved from hunger. In chapter 17, thirst again and defeat. In chapter 18, preserved from chaos. Then from chapter 19 to chapter 32, they get to Sinai, receive the law. They receive the rules of personal conduct, the order of the feast, the order of the tabernacle, the order of priesthood. All this time they've been carrying with them the wealth of Egypt, the gold, the silver, and all the possessions that they needed to build the tabernacle of God. Amen. Got to hear this. Now, but some use their gold... To build golden calf. And the Lord destroyed those people and destroyed their idols, but he melted the gold. Follow the story. Just read the chapter. He melted their gold and destroyed the people. In Exodus chapter 35, I was going to just quote it, but let's, let's just start. Everybody getting anything? Yeah. Yeah. Chapter, just quickly, chapter 35. Let's begin looking verse 5. Now, this is really critical, so I'm, gonna, I'm not going to rush through it, okay? And you need to read the chapter and take your sweet time studying it. But verse 5 says, Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord. I'm not receiving an offering. I just want you to see this. Whosoever is of a willing heart, who is there, what? Willing. willing heart, let him bring it, an offering of the Lord, gold and silver and brass, and blue and purple and scarlet, goat's hair, Ram skin dyed red, oil for the light, that's verse 8, oxen, stone, verse 10, and every wise hearted, everyone with good judgment, people that are wise, every wise heart among you shall come and make all that the Lord has commanded. The tabernacle, his tent, his covering, all of that which is the, the, the claps, the boards, the bars, the pillars, the sockets the, for the Ark of the Covenant, for the mercy seat, for the table of showbread, for the candlestick, verse 14, the furnishing, the lamps, the incense altar, verse 16, the altar of burnt offerings, all the way, even, 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 verse 19, the close of service to do service in the holy place, the holy garments of Aaron, the priest, and the garments of his son, listen, to minister in the priest's office. I wish I had time to talk about the clothes. Okay, never mind. Because your response, horrible, horrible. <laughs> you know, God cares about how you enter his presence. Can I just, quick second? Yeah. Just a quick second. And I say this to all of you as children, beloved sons and daughters of the Lord of this house. I say this to all my sons, to my children. Um, what's with the holes in your pants? You know, um, have any of you ever been on a date? Yes. Two people. Maybe, maybe, that is, maybe, that, maybe, maybe that is not a good example. How about, how about how, wait, any of you ever, um, Nick is going to get married. Hey. Yeah. So, are you going to dress like this when you marry this beautiful woman? Probably not, no. What do you mean probably not? <laughs> I mean... Okay, there's no holes. Thank you, Jesus. 
You know, he looks nice. She looks better, but it's, it's okay. Okay. What are you going to wear when you get married? Okay, Nick, you got to start with the word probably. Okay. Are you, I will help you get one. Okay. It'll be polyester cheap, but hey, I'll give you one. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But he's going to get married. He's going to a wedding. If you were to go meet the president, not the one we got, but the good one, okay? <laughs> what are you going to wear to visit the president? What are you going to wear when you're going to go meet the king of all things? You're going to go in shorts? It's okay. Listen, I love the way you people are. I love your, your casual knock it off. I said that in love. I, I want you to understand what I'm saying. Um, you see the shirt? You like it? Thank you. Someone said they love it. I only wear it when I'm preaching. See these pants? I don't go to dinner with my wife in these pants. I have two sets of clothes in my closet. Now, I'm not saying you have to be as crazy as I am. I know it's a little bit, and I'm probably way, going way overboard here. And I can tell you right now, my sons are watching the live stream and they're saying, oh, please, Baba, no, please, Baba, no. <laughs> and, 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 and I say back to my sons, please, son, shut up, please, son, shut up. Okay? Ooh. <laughs> Gotta push this all the way in next time. Okay. <laughs> I have two sets of clothes. I have the priest's garment. I got a whole line of suits. Back in the day when we wore suits, in some churches I still wear them. I'm very grateful not to be wearing a tie because I was always doing this trying to breathe. But I got them. I've never worn any of them. I have actually have two suits I wear for weddings. I don't wear them to preach. Now, I know it's extreme. Should I tell him everything? I'm looking at my wife. I can't see you. Yes, no. She's not responding. That's not a good sign. But I have, I have a top drawer. <laughs> Help me, Jesus. Listen, 40 years of this. Okay? In my top drawer are all my undergarments. That I only wear when I'm preaching. In my second drawer, I have a divider between the socks for preaching and everyday socks. Now, I don't suggest you do that because you can get a little bit crazy. Because when my wife puts the socks in the drawer after laundry, she just puts them on the drawer. And I have to go through this one. is for preaching. This one is not. How many times do I have to tell you this is not over here? This goes over here. So I, I drive the woman completely crazy. Ask me why. why. <laughs> the people that are willing to bring their offering for the whole tabernacle, God includes for the garments of the high priest and his sons. You know, they didn't have a change of clothes. It's not like they had, you know, uh, luggage in the wilderness. And so when, when they would come to the bottom of the mountain, God said to Moses, when the people gather to the bottom of the mountain, make sure they wash their clothes. He cares what you look like and how you smell. For the love of God, take a shower. Brush your teeth. Gargle. We're coming in the presence of the king. I'm not telling you to all of a sudden become spiffy, okay? <laughs> I feel like there's a spirit of conviction. <laughs> and I'm not saying, you know, go shop, or, you know, maybe people can't afford it. But, you know, here's what you do. Get the best you got. It's the way you do it with offering. The way you present yourself, the way you humble yourself, 
the way you worship, the way you give, and the way you dress. Just give God your best. It's really that simple. I'm going to, listen, I'm going to love you anyway. If your breast stinks, I might say something. But follow carefully. After all their sequence, God gives them specific instructions on to prepare for the tabernacle to be built. That's the kingdom of God. That's the work of the ministry. And God is very, very meticulous. Make sure you only speak to those that are a willing heart. Those that have wise judgment. Those that understand the value and bring all that is necessary. The gold, the silver, and all the material that is necessary to build the tabernacle of the congregation, including the garments of the high priest and his sons. Verse 21. And they came, everyone whose heart stirred him up within him. So God is looking for those that will have a heart stirred. And everyone in whom is his spirit made willing. And they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation. And for all his service and for all the holy garments. And they came both men and women as many, underline these words, as many as were willing hearted. As many as willing hearted. Those with a willing heart brought their bracelets, their earrings, their rings, their bracelets, the jewels of gold. And every man offered an offering of gold unto the Lord. Jump down, verse 25. And all the women, the, the wise-hearted, they, they spun, they, they worked with their hands. Jump down to verse 25. The children of Israel brought, here it is again, excuse me, here, a willing offering. So, a what? Willing. A willing offering unto the Lord. Every man and woman whose heart made them willing. God did not want it from anyone that's not willing to bring all manner of work which the Lord has commanded over and over again to bring it to the hands of Moses. So here God is like making, being very meticulous. In chapter 36, the people brought so much that in verse 6, Moses commands the people stop giving. In verse 7, they had so much, not only enough to finish, but they had too much. When they finished building the tabernacle of the congregation, God filled it with his glory and that was the end of the book of Exodus. Listen, it began with getting out of the old life, ending an old journey, getting out of the old restrictions, and ending up being filled with the glory of God. In the Exodus, God not only separated the Egyptians from the Israelites, but he also separated the Israelites from the Israelites. One more time. When God separated, not only from the Israelites from the Egyptians, but Israelites from the Israelites, from the wise-hearted with good judgment from those without. From the willing to those that are not willing. The willing will encounter the glory, see the cloud of God, and keep the wealth of Egypt. They will build the tabernacle of the congregation that will advance the kingdom of God and provide for the ministry of God. The true exodus Ended up being a trial on how people handle their wealth. Wow. 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 Because the ones that kept it, hearts not willing, died with it. In Exodus 12, God tells Moses, I will execute judgment in one night. This will be a quick work. Follow carefully. Each family is to take one unblemished lamb, sacrifice it, put the blood on the doorposts of the house. Roast it on fire. There's no time to boil it. I want you to listen very carefully. Please read this on your own time. Roast it on the fire. No time to boil it. And there's no time to bake bread with leaven. Eat it unleavened. In verse 11, he said, Eat with your belts on, girded, your shoes on, and your staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste. Do what? Eat it in haste. This is how the Lord's first Passover went. You're going to have to eat this on the run. God says, there's no time to put yeast in the bread, wait for it to rise. 
There's no time to boil and then cook. There's, I want you to take the lamb and put it over the fire. Take the bread like crackers without yeast and eat it fast. And while you're eating, make sure you're already dressed. Your shoes are on, your belts are on, and your rod is ready to go. I'm going to do this so fast you're not going to have time. I want you to do this quickly. Eat in haste. Don't take your sweet time chewing. Swallow your food. Because this is going to happen quickly. This is God's first Passover. Don't pay attention to the noise outside. Enjoy your feast while I bring an end to the fair order. God is saying, when I execute this last move before your exodus, it is going to happen in one night. What you've waited for for years, you will see happen in one night. Amen. Exodus 12, 41 says, and it'll come to pass at the end of 430 years, follow carefully, the same self day that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. The Amplified reads, and the end of 430 years, listen, to that very day, all the hosts of the Lord gathered into a tribal of army, left the land of Egypt. Verse 51, the living translation says, one that on that very day, the Lord brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt like an army. For 430 years, they were known as slaves. In one night, they become the army of God. Four hundred and thirty years, God waited for something. Here's where we are. Four hundred and thirty years, God waited. Remember, the book of Exodus is but a shadow of better things to come. What better things to come? It's not some hopeful prophecy that sounds good but never comes to pass. It is the word of God casting a shadow of what is about to happen. This is how the children of Issachar understood the times and understood what is about to happen. First Chronicles twelve thirty two. Even though they knew, listen, that there cannot be any books added to the letter of the Bible, but we are the reenactment of the final stamp what the Spirit of the Lord is saying in the book of Exodus. I'm here to tell you we're never going back to what we've come out of. I said, I'm here to tell you we're never going back to what we come out of. It was the Lord that, in, that instituted this Exodus of his people and said to Moses, Exodus 3, 7, I have surely seen the affliction of my people. I've heard their cry and know their sorrow. They cried out and he heard in verse 8. And he said, I am come down to deliver them. Listen carefully. I am come down to deliver them. See, God waited for 430 years. It's not that he ignored them. If you read Exodus 12, 42, it actually says God waited for that day. He marked it. He waited. What was he waiting for? A cry. I'm not going to just show up. I need the people to cry out. For 430 years, they didn't cry out. Now they cry, and God hears it. So God gets a hold of Moses, 80 years old, and speaks to him out of a burning bush. And he says, the cry of the people has reached my ear. I want you to go back to Egypt and deliver them. And God said, I am come down to deliver them. This time, he's not sending another Moses, but he's in a people to do the work for himself. He's not coming down. He didn't say, I am coming. He said, I come down. I am come. Say that. Say it again. He didn't say, I'm coming. We're not talking about the second coming. He said, I am come. Is he in you right now? He's going to do the work for himself. And so God here is saying, when the Israelites cried, they didn't have a pattern. They didn't know what was going to happen to them. I'm sure after 430 years, they thought this is never going to happen. But we have a pattern. We know what's going to happen. It's hindsight for us. Therefore, our cry is not in anguish, but in the assurance of faith. Our cry is the declaration of deliverance and not sorrow. But we must cry. I said we must cry. It is the push that will initiate the move of God like this world has never seen. God has seen the afflictions. God has heard. God knows of the sorrows. But we have to lift our voice and pray. Not in doubt. Not even in hope. But in the certainty. We're about to have an exodus. 
We're going to come out of where we've been and enter into where we've never been. God's going, listen, Lord, in Jesus' name, we're never going back to the diseases. We're never going back to the sicknesses. We're never going back to the COVID. Say something. No matter what the strategies of darkness will be, I say in Jesus' name, we will never go back to those kind of days again. We're not going to go back to the poverties. We're not going to go back to those conditions. That cancer will never come back in the name of Jesus. That fear will never come back in the name of Jesus. That poverty will never come back. I need someone to help me. That lack will never come back in Jesus' name. In Exodus 2, 23 and 24, this is before God calls Moses. It says, years had passed and the king of Egypt died. And the people of Israel cried because of their bondage. And you remember, there was a good Pharaoh in the time of, of Joseph. He dies. The whole generation dies. Now God comes a time where years have passed. The king of Egypt died. The people of Israel cried because of their bondage. And their cry came up before God, verse 24. And it says, this is Exodus 2, verse 24. And God heard their groaning and remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Therefore... God appeared to Moses in the midst of a burning bush when he was 80 years old. And God said, I've heard the cry of my people. Amen. I want you to hear this. Noah, get yourself to the keyboard. Follow this. Go quickly to Psalms chapter 18. I'm just about done. Psalms chapter 18. The psalmist said in, in verse 6. You all there? Psalms 18, 6. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. And cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple. And my cry came before him even into his ears. Then, someone say then. Yes. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken. Why? Because he was wroth. Smoke came out of his mouth and God began to bring judgment. David is saying, in my distress I called unto the Lord. And my voice reached his ear. Verse 7 describes after God heard, God moved with anger and destroyed the enemies of David. The foundations, can you imagine? You cry and the foundations of the earth shake and fire comes out of the mouth of God. The end of the Old Testament ends. And it ends with a prophecy. And it says, and the messenger of God will come, prepare the way of the Lord. Malachi 3.1. The whole Old Testament comes to an end that the messenger of God is going to prepare the way of the Lord. In Malachi 3.1. The New Testament opens with Matthew 3. John the Baptist crying in the wilderness saying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Malachi 3 tells us, he will prepare. Matthew 3 tells us how he will prepare. One more time. Malachi 3 tells us the messenger of God will prepare. Matthew 3 tells us how he will prepare. And it says, verse 3, Matthew 3, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. What ushered the way of the Lord was a cry. If my people called by my name will humble themselves, Second Chronicles seven fourteen, pray and seek my face and turn, turn from what? Their wicked ways. That word wicked doesn't just mean sin. It includes distress. Adversity. The things that are wrong. Turn away from your stress. Don't let your prayer be a complaint. Turn away from your burdens. What's stressing you out? The word also means trouble. Turn from your trouble. If my people, called by my name, will humble themselves and pray 
and seek my identity. Come back to where you belong. And turn from your stress. Turn away from your trouble. Listen, I will hear them. I will hear that heaven. And I will feel, forgive their sin. I will free them from their stress. And I'll heal their land. Our exodus is a certainty. But we have to pray like it. I said we have to pray like it. There has to be a cry. That means you can't just sit around and wait for someone else to do it. That means there has to come a place in you that all of your personal dignity takes aside. That means you have to just not worry about whatever it is that is the wicked, the wrong, the adversity, the troubles, the pressures, the stresses, whatever it is that has kind of occupied your thinking. Maybe get away from the bills for a minute. Shut off the bills. Shut the checkbook. People don't have checkbooks anymore. Get in your closet. If my people will cry out, I'll hear their cry. Stop criticizing what's going on in the world. Begin to make declarations. God bring the whole system down. As you stand to your feet, I need someone to agree with me. Bring down the whole wickedness. Now, I know a lot of Christians, you know, they want to see you know, if God so chooses to save them, it's by His grace. Right? But the system of evil cannot be saved. The system of, if you would call it the bondage, you can't save bondage. And as much as we don't like to hear it, but the reality is there's light and there's darkness. How can you distinguish the difference if there isn't? The way you know darkness is because it's not lit. Right? There's good, there's evil. There are blessings, there are cursings. There's life, there's death. There's heaven, there's hell. God says, choose life. Choose blessings. And so there is a, and I don't mean here, just generally speaking, there's, there's a lethargic, no crying, no declaring, observing, you know, people have become so used to being in front of a screen, they become observers. They just kind of go into a numb state yeah. where they just observe. God wants to hear your cry. Yeah. Cry for your family. Come on, lift your hands. Yeah. Cry for your children. Yeah. Cry for your loved ones. Yeah. Cry for your mothers. Cry for your fathers. Yeah. Cry for your families, for your descendants, for your grandchildren. Yeah. Cry for your city. Cry for your nation. Yeah. Cry for, come on, every hand raised. So Father, in Jesus' name, we are your people and we have come to lift our voices. No, church, come on, I need you to lift up your voice. Do you understand that they didn't have to wait 430 years to be free? Do you understand they could have waited 30 days and been free if they could have just raised their voice? But for 430 years, God waited for a people to be willing to raise their voice and hear the cry of their distress. So I don't know about you, but there's a desperation in the Holy Ghost. I said, there's a desperation in the Holy Ghost. There's a desperation in the realm of the Spirit. There's a cry out of the heavens. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done in this earth as it is in heaven.
God in vain. Intervene. Take down the evils. Come on, church. Take down the wicked. Take down the corruption. Expose the darkness. Let your light so shine. Move upon Washington. Move upon Congress. Move upon the White House. Let your judgment come. Let redemption come. Let salvation come. That in the name of Jesus, Father, we declare our children will be able to pray in the school again. Lord, in Jesus' mighty name, a revival shall break out into the streets and worship break out of the church walls. And we shall hear worship in the Middle East. We shall hear worship in China. We shall hear worship in Iran. We shall hear worship in Israel. We shall hear worship in all over the land. I need someone to agree with me. State after state, nation after nation. Come on church, there shall be worship in the neighborhoods. Father, we are desperate for you. We need you to invade our nations. We need you to invade our families. We need you to invade this world. Let your kingdom come, God. Let your will be done in this earth. We're not just asking you for a revival. We're asking you for a reformation. Destroy religion. Shut down religion. Let there be a move of the Holy Ghost. Let it be a cry of the Holy Ghost. Lord, as it was in the beginning, darkness upon the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light. I pray for my sons that no power of hell will be able to interrupt. Nothing will divide. Be of one mind, of one accord, in one spirit. And there shall be a revival in Dallas. There shall be a revival in Tennessee. There shall be a revival in Chicago. Let it spread like wildfire. Father, we declare in Jesus' name a move like Europe has never seen. A move like Africa has never seen. A move like has never seen a move like the Middle East has never known like Asia has never witnessed come on church in Jesus name those of other religions will convert Islam will bow the knee to Jesus Christ Hinduism will bow the knee to Jesus Christ. Religions will bow the knee to Jesus Christ. Baptist churches will begin to cry. Come Holy Ghost. Come Holy Ghost. Let our words not fall to the ground until we see the demonstration of your kingdom come. And your will be done in this earth as it is in heaven. In the mighty name of Jesus, we declare it. And all the people of God shouted, Amen. Come on, give them a mighty praise. Before we dismiss, I'm going to ask the altar team to come. Just line up right here face the people. If any of you are in need of any prayer for anything, especially those of you visiting, if you would like to come and receive prayer, speak to any of these altar workers. I uh, love it. Um, how many of you will, will take the time to hear this again? And people of God, um, I pray you are blessed. 
But I'm not so much after you being blessed, as, as grateful as I am for, for the blessing God's given us. But I want this to be part of your thinking. I'm not going to tell you what I feel. And God uses me at, in nations. God speaks to me to do with governments. What is about to happen in the world is not good. What is about to happen among nations is not good. We have to pray. We could be on a verge of a war like this world has not seen. We're beginning to see the beginning fireworks. That's all they are in comparison to what bombs may be coming. So we have to pray to shut that down. I so said we have to pray to shut it down. And I pray we won't see it. But there's judgment coming. It's going to be a great day and a terrible day all at once. A great day for the people of God. And a terrible day of judgment for those that are not. Our God is a just God. He's not allow things to continue for very long. He's just waiting on the people's cry. But now that you heard it, you have to make sure that you have a distinction. A distinction. We got Halloween coming. Don't get involved with darkness. I know some of you think it's fun then put on an angelic outfit and dance inside of your living room you're kind of weird but whatever don't get involved with darkness I need you to separate yourself in your mind make sure you are separated because when the judgment begins economy collapses don't worry about your money Say that again. When the economy collapses, banks shut down. Don't worry about your money. You give better than you've ever given. Because remember, you are the people of Goshen. What affects them will not affect you. Their problems are not your problems. Are you all hearing me? So it's really critical that you don't just receive this as a nice word. It's a preparation. It's a warning. And you make sure you stay plugged in the house. Because we're about to see God do what God has never done in this earth. It's going to be like a wildfire. It's going to light up the Middle East. I believe the eyes of Israel will become open. Palestinians are going to get saved. Egyptians are going to get saved. Are you all hearing me? God's going to move in Saudi Arabia. God's going to move in Jordan. God's going to move in Egypt. God's going to move into China. God's going to move into Iran. You know, they, they might be able to fight it out, but they can't stop the hand of God. Cry out, people of the Lord. I love you. I'll see you next Sunday. If you need prayer, please come forward. Otherwise, have a glorious week, and we'll see you next week.